Welcome to Real Israel and our weekly show, What the Israeli Papers Say. My name's Paul Alster and I'm with you once again. As ever, we're aiming to play it straight down the middle, offering a balanced view of what's going on in Israel. We're not trying to convince you that everything in the garden is rosy, but then again, we're not here to be Israel bashing and only looking for negative angles on this country. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined this week by two excellent guests. Uh, first of all, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner was for many years a familiar face on televisions the world over as the spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Force. And since leaving the military, he has been working as Director General of the International Relations Division at the Histadrut General Federation of Labor, that is the Umbrella Trades Union organization in Israel. Hello, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here. And alongside uh, Peter, we have Benjamin Weinthal, who's becoming a, a familiar figure on uh, what the Israeli papers say. Uh, he is the European correspondent for the Jerusalem Post and is a fellow at the Washington-based Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's also a regular contributor to a number of German news outlets and his coverage of the activities of Iran and Hezbollah have been widely praised. Welcome, Benjamin. Thanks for having me, Paul. Well, as always, we're looking to go through all sorts of different news stories that have featured over the last uh, seven days. And uh, we've lined up one or two interesting stories that I'm sure you're uh, going to enjoy hearing about, or at least endure uh, hearing about. But the one thing I want to do, first of all, is to uh, very quickly relate to a story that um, broke yesterday, which was uh, very surprising. In the Knesset, there was a move to uh, try and investigate um, case 3000, which is known as the submarine affair, which the attorney general had decided the previous week was uh, not ready or fit for investigation. And the vote originally went through and then it was voided. And this is very, very controversial. It's been quite a sensational uh, incident. And Peter, uh, I'm sure you would have seen what happened. What were your initial thoughts when you saw uh, what happened there in the Knesset yesterday? My or original thought was, oh my God, how are they doing this? I think you know, we pride ourselves in being the only democracy in the Middle East. And how do you void a uh, piece of legislation that just went through? Obviously, in the aftermath and, and the explanations that became afterwards uh, related to technical issues in the process that made it reasonable that it would be voided. But I think that the, the biggest fumble here was actually the head of the coalition who was actually supposed to organize the, the parliamentarians in place so that they're ready to vote according to what they wanted and get the, uh, the motion pushed off. Uh, he failed in preparing that and then it went through the technicalities and ultimately it changed. But basically to begin with, it was, wow, mind blowing. How did this happen? How can we let this happen in our democracy? Yeah, it certainly was a shock when it happened, and it, it looked quite chaotic, a real balagan, as we say here in Israel. Benjamin, what was your reaction to the fact that this uh, vote passed and then was voided, a vote that, of course, would have uh, been very uh, uh, troubling to the prime minister if he was ha having to go into further investigations of the story uh, in which he's alleged to have had connections to the submarine deal? Well, the, the submarine affair is is is, is a utterly serious um, case in, involving allegations of um, corruption and, and possible uh, financial misconduct by uh, President Netanyahu. So um, as a journalist, obviously I'm um, of the view that the, the more transparency, the better. So the vote was, um, was shocking and um, one hopes that there will be um, a probe to see what exactly happened with this submarine case. What I found disturbing also about the case that sort of got lost in, in, in the chaos of this whole, of the allegations is the German company that built these submarines, it's called Tyson Krupp. Um, I reported on them for over 10 years because of their connection to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Tyson Krupp is partially owned by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, at least I think the last report three, four percent of the companies owned by Iran's regime or has uh, in investments in this company. And the company has vehemently opposed uh, breaking off from Iran. 
Um, when the submarine affair surfaced, Germ the Israeli media reported on this, but I had reported on it uh, previously, and it doesn't seem to phase neither the German government nor the Israeli government, and it should, in my view, that Iran is tangled up in this affair. Yeah, it's certainly, I think it's, uh, of all the cases that the Prime Minister is involved in and that there are uh, charges uh, laid, uh, for me, uh, also as a journalist, this is the one that is the most worrying uh, and potentially the, the most uh, explosive, but it's something that isn't going to be investigated any further at this point. But I think what does need a bit of investigation very quickly is the way things are organised in the Knesset, because whether it was right or whether it was wrong, it reflects very badly, I think, on uh, Israeli democracy when a vote mm -hmm. goes through. And then a moment later, it's cancelled, especially when the person cancelling it is somebody that is close to the prime minister. But uh, anyway, we shall uh, doubtless, I suspect, hear quite a lot more about submarines and other similar shenanigans as we go forward. But uh, our first scheduled story is one that is a very interesting um uh, story to consider here because uh, I'm sure everybody watching will know about all the issues uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, sometimes very vitriolic and all sorts of problems. Now, one of the main um, personalities of uh, Palestinian uh, politics, certainly for as long as I've been involved, and you know, 30 years or so, is Saeed Barakat, who's been a very powerful spokesman for uh, the Palestinians. He's been unwell for quite a period of time, and uh, he has had uh, uh, major surgeries, but now we understand he's suffering from complications to do with COVID. And Peter uh, Deval, which is uh, a news site connected to uh, your Histadrut organization, has reported this along with other uh, outlets. What about the dilemma that this leader of an opposing nation that we're in all sorts of uh, issues with is being treated here in Israel at this particular time? What is your view on this one? My view is that, first of all, it's the right thing to do. Um, Basically, uh, we have these relationships with the Palestinians over the co course of the last 30, 40 years, and uh, there is a mutual dependency. And when we look at the relationship that we've developed with the, with, the, uh, with the Palestinian Authority and their spokespersons, and I would even say even some of the people that are deemed complete enemies of Israel, members of Hamas, Ismail Haniyeh's family, uh, when people are in dire need, we always extend a helping hand. And we send military missions across the world to help people in earth, earthquakes and, and, and other natural disasters. Uh, and our neighbors here, if they need that help, I think it's the, just the right thing to do. Uh, it has raised a lot of controversy because of some of the things that Arakat has said over the years. Uh, rightfully, it's good to question it. But in the end of the day, we have to have that moral compass that guides us in extending helping hands to human beings that are in dire need. If we can help, why shouldn't we? Benjamin, your thoughts on this one? Well, I, I, I share, uh, uh, I guess, Peter's view of um, what, you know, what folks have called Jewish ethics in terms of handling Eric uh health crisis. Um, on the other hand, as, as we know, uh, there's been a lot of uh, intense criticism. Um, Many have cited Israelis and, and I think Jews in the diaspora, the, the famous uh, passage from the Midrash, he who becomes compassionate to the cruel will ultimately become cruel to the compassionate. Um, now, you know, I, I, I certainly understand the meaning and content of that quote, but in this case, um, working, providing medical care, dire, uh, life essential medical care to a PLO negotiator that that Israel's worked with over the years seems to me to be a, a perfectly reasonable uh, decision. There is one issue though, and uh, this was noted in a couple of outlets uh, when I was looking at this story, that uh, in the event, and Erekat is very, very seriously ill by all accounts, and uh, you know we wish him and his family well, but who knows where this is going to go. In the event that he were to pass away, all the conspiracy theorists would surely be out there saying, well, the Israelis killed him in hospital and this type of thing. Do you think um, it, the you know, the road to hell can be paved with good intentions, as they say? Do you think it, Israel could be making a, a rod for its own back here, Peter first? I don't think so. I think that, you know, there will always be these types of conspiracy, conspiracy theories 
um, especially when it comes to the relationship uh, with the Palestinians. But ultimately, I think the majority of people, um, you know, we have Palestinians coming in every day to hospitals to be treated in Israel because we have a more sustainable health system here. Uh, and so every day Palestinians come here for medical assistance. So why would it be any different for uh, Saeed Barakat? He is, of course, a, a far higher profile than most everyday Palestinians that come in. And he has been something of a firebrand, particularly over the last uh, five years or so. Benjamin, would you have any concerns that this could rebound on Israel um, in the not too distant future? Well, these, these wildly out of control anti-Semitic conspiracy theories um, unfortunately, permeate uh, our region. Um, I mean, there it, 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 these theories will surface, uh, Paul, and I think it's important that you mentioned it. Um, I know Erika's uh, daughter, who's a physician, is at Hadassah Medical Center with him, and she's mm -hmm. been reporting daily about his condition. I believe Israeli physicians are working also with American physicians on his case. He certainly is receiving the best possible medical care, not only in the region, but probably the world right now for his condition. Um, one can only try to debunk these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, but they'll always be present. Uh, not always, I should say, but they will be present. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good point. And Peter, did you have much uh, contact personally with Saeed Barakat when you were both uh, speaking on behalf of opposing sides of the argument? Uh, did you get to know him at all? Uh, in, I would say, I met him a couple of times in previous positions when I was working in the coordination of government activities in the territories uh, during the negotiations and the uh, the Oslo days uh, when he was very prominent and he was always around and it was part of he was part of the teams. So I'd met him a couple of times. I wouldn't necessarily put it much more than uh, nice to meet you, hello sir, and a uh, handshake. Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. Well, let's wish him well anyway, and let's hope that uh, this story uh, resolves well for everybody involved. Now, I want to go uh, to another story here because there's been some very interesting reporting uh, in uh, recent weeks uh, connected to the Iran issue and the United Nations and the end of the arms embargo. And the Jerusalem Post have uh, covered this. Uh, Benjamin, of course, one of their senior correspondents who specializes particularly in uh, reporting relating to Iran and uh, their proxy, uh, Hezbollah. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an overview on the way things stand now uh, since uh, things have changed uh, with regard to the UN, Benjamin? Well, the UN uh, weapons embargo on the Islamic Republic of Iran expired this month, and uh, much to the disappointment, uh, I would say acute disappointment of the uh, Israeli government and the U.S., uh, allies such as France, Germany, and Britain uh, opted not to oppose the extension of the weapons embargo against Iran. That would allow Iran now to buy weapons from China and Russia to be used in their proxy wars against Syrian civilians, uh, civilians in Yemen, and of course, uh, Israel. So the situation, in my view, is a giant farce. And uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and uh, French President uh, Emmanuel Macron have contributed to, um, unfortunately, destabilizing the Middle East and jeopardizing Israel's security. Um, there's no other way to put it, and it's particularly, I think, an enormously disappointing uh, response from Merkel, who, who has pledged uh, back in 2008 that in the Knesset that Israel's security, open quote, uh, is non-negotiable, close quote, for her administration. So we're, we're at, a, at a, a situation that's highly dangerous for Israel. The United States has said, uh, Senator, uh, excuse me, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, it, the United States will sanction any entities and persons involved in uh, selling weapons to Iran. So that's a, a good response. The problem again is Europe's uh, utterly soggy appeasement toward uh, Iran's regime. And, and Peter, what's your take on this? Obviously, with your time in the military and speaking on these matters for so many years, how concerned are you? Um, I would divide it up into perhaps three separate issues. First of all, uh, the fact that the world leaders can't seem to get the, this priority right is actually a reflection on the state of internationalism. 
uh, where people can't seem to, you know, you, trying to fight the coronavirus, trying to fight uh, uh, radical uh, I I Iran. If you can't seem to get the priorities right, it's always got things are always going to fall through the gaps, and that that gap leads to perhaps the second issue, the state of Iran. Now, Iran over the years and before the embargo was placed had the ability to buy advanced weaponry, uh, but they were lacking in funds on one hand, or they were lacking on the other hand with um, with a partner to buy from. So even when they wanted to buy uh, advanced uh, uh, aerial defense capabilities, the S-300, the Russian S-300, it took them something like 14 years to be able to receive those, those munitions. Four years ago, they asked for the S-400, and they still haven't received a response from the Russians. So the Russians have their own interests playing on who they want to sell. We're no longer in the situation of, of you know, the, the 90s when Russia was handing out arms to be favored by regional players uh, around the world. Now they need the money. So if you can't pay for it, you aren't getting it. Um, and the third level, obviously, would, would permeate down to the level of what it actually means for Israel. Um, and this could actually mean if they're able to get advanced weaponry and that they pass them on to their regional proxies like in, in Syria with Assad's regime or Hezbollah, then we could see an uptick in IDF activity to counter those measures in, uh, before they're positioned or en route as we've, been, as we've seen and has been reported extensively over recent years. So I think on those three levels, it's a, it's a poor reflection of the state of the world generally, uh, where you need to highlight the bad actors of the world, those that uh, take advantage and abuse and are hostile, uh, definitely in a region like the Middle East. <laughs> And uh, to both of you, uh, hearing what you say uh, about all these issues, how much does the Trump factor come into these reactions uh, from other member states of the United Nations? Pre President Trump, very unpopular with many European and other leaders. Do you think many of them are doing this, uh, as we say in Hebrew, dafka, just to kind of uh, make a point uh, about Trump uh, as much and his policies in, in the region? Benjamin? Um, I, I mean, I've heard some chatter that the Europeans, uh, you know, used Trump as a pretext to uh, not extend the UN uh, weapons embargo and invoke the uh, snapback sanctions against Iran because of Iran's violation of the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. I find that that excuse uh, to be a, just a bogus excuse. I think the Europeans are deeply wedded to the Iran deal because they're largely interested in, in business deals with Iran. Uh, it's a continuation of uh, over 40 years of uh, accommodating a regime that's the, uh, according to the State Department, State Department under the Obama, the Democratic administration and the Trump administration, the world's worst state sponsor of terrorism. Um, so the Europeans and Germany's probably the best example. It's the fifth largest trading partner of uh, Iran, according to the new uh, EU statistics this year, over 1 billion euros in trade took place uh, from Germany uh, with Iran. So uh, again, I, I, I see that as, as just utter nonsense because the Europeans feel that uh, this, this deal is the be all and end all of all uh, non-proliferation deals. And it's actually the, the world's worst uh, anti-proliferation deal because it allows Iran within a certain period of time to build a nuclear weapons device. And Peter, just to wrap this particular section up, from again from your time when you were previously <clears throat> involved with the Israeli military, when you, you were working in that role and, and the Israeli military was looking at what was going on uh, with Iran, how much did they feel that the United Nations was uh, uh, being a, a fair broker and that Israel was getting a fair hearing on this particular subject? I think that it's been a long time since the Israeli establishment put too much weight on the UN as a fair broker. Um, the you know whether it's been on peacekeeping forces on our borders or um, activities that have gone into uh, trying to seek and find out the uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons and within within Iran, um, these types of things. I don't think Israel has never been dependent on outside forces to try and judge 
um, definitely not in a, in a position of fairness. And I think the, the, the UN body as a whole is, is institutionally uh, set up um, by just by, by sheer, sheer numbers uh, to undermine and, and, and I would say sidestep and, and put Israel in a position where we have very little room to maneuver and therefore the, the, the emphasis is always going to be on our own abilities to identify the needs, our, our own ability to uh, understand the intelligence of what's happening in Iran or what's happening on our borders. I think that translating that into action uh, and action items is always going to be prioritized over the international community. Yeah, it's... Uh uh, a, a fascinating situation, of course. It's very worrying uh, for people here in Israel. But for those watching on outside, I know a lot of people don't seem to understand quite Israel's objections to the UN. But uh, it's quite a different story when you're having to live with the consequences of their um, their decisions, I suppose. And on a, a slightly related point, we move on to another story. We've got two guys here that are very much... Uh, uh, experts in this particular field. We've spoken about Iran, but there was an interesting opinion piece just this last week by Ron Benishai, who's a very respected uh, commentator here in Israel. It was in the Ynet, uh, Yediot Achronot's uh, online version, ynet.co.il. And uh, he was suggesting that the situation in Gaza with Hamas is posing a bigger threat to Israel than Hezbollah on the northern border uh, in uh, Lebanon and, and Syria. Now, what do we think about this? Uh, you, you've both uh, had, you know, great uh, uh, connections to the these particular stories. I'll come to you first, Peter, with this. Is it either or? Is is it a, a sensible view, or is there something behind what uh, Ron Benishai said? Well, I think when the military determines its priorities of threats, then it has to. Uh, list the prioritize in probability. And I think the, the general sense of probability within the Israeli defense establishment is that Hezbollah is less volatile, even though they have more force than Hamas in Gaza. And just this week, uh, the IDF exposed another tunnel coming from Gaza into Israel. It was foiled um, a tun tunnel that only serves uh, a, a purpose of terrorism, infiltration to attack uh, abduct or detonate uh, 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 military positions. So I would say the the, the idea that the uh, that the the perspective is Hamas is unstable. The region uh, the, uh, the threat from Gaza is uh, while it may be is definitely not on the magnitude of the weapons and the weapon capabilities that Hezbollah has. It's less that because they are less stable, the probability of a conflict happening is more likely to happen from a place uh, from 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 the Gaza Strip. And that's why when when the military looks at it, they probably decide every year they decide uh, what is the threat analysis of uh, all of our region. And then they have to prioritize and that prioritization uh, serves a tool for how you train your forces, what type of intelligence you need to gather, what type of uh, weaponry and munitions you need to uh, uh, to buy or develop, and uh, and that's how basically you prioritize your uh, annual pa plan of action. And uh, Benjamin, you obviously spend a lot of time following the activities of Hezbollah and reporting on their activities both in the region and uh, uh, on a broader scale uh, into Europe and beyond. Um, are, are you persuaded as well that at this point in time, the, the bigger danger to Israel comes from Gaza or, or do you feel that Hezbollah uh, could still kick something off uh, fairly soon if they had the opportunity? Well. You know, just to mirror what um, or piggyback on what Peter said because of his his military expertise, um, it strikes me that uh, um, that Israel's military and defense establishment has has analyzed the situation and uh, there's seems to be a, a probability because of the volatile nature of the terrorist entity Hamas that controls Gaza that there could be another <coughs> uh, war or mini war or um, uh, rocket exchanges. Um, and there's been some efforts by the Egyptians to ameliorate 
uh, the crisis via negotiations. I always think it's a good thing when Egypt's involved as a mediator, um, and uh, that helps with the region as opposed to having external actors involved, um, like the Europeans, who I think should have less involvement in the region. And uh, there's also been infusions of cash, tens of millions of dollars from Qatar's regime to help alleviate the situation. But this is sort of, again, a more of a, a mow the lawn situation, as we say here, where you uh, you have a conflict and, uh, you know, there are rockets fired by uh, Hamas and Israel retaliates in response and tries to defuse uh, jingoism from the region, uh, for, excuse me, from uh, the Gaza Strip. And then Qatar enters and pumps more money into the situation. There's a period of quiet. And then the situation resurfaces again once Hamas demands more money. So that's the, the, the cycle as I see it. In terms of the, the Ynet analysis from Ron ben which I thought was, was fascinating because uh, he, he identified Hamas, uh, uh, Hamas as the, the chief uh, strategic threat or short-term threat for Israel. Um, Hezbollah was the, the, the fifth threat on his list of the top five. And he, he quoted in a military official, which I thought was utterly fascinating, who said, uh, open quote, what Lebanon got served in 33 days of fighting in 2006, it will now receive in one day, close quote, referring to the 2006 second war in Lebanon. So mm -hmm. Israel is obviously very concerned about heightening its deterrence in the north, whereas Peter mentioned the threat is much more serious because of Hezbollah's rocket arsenal of probably over 150,000 rockets aimed at Israel right now. And do either of you think that given the problems that Hezbollah has been having in Lebanon with the Beirut uh, port explosion and the fact that their role within the uh, government in Lebanon has come under huge criticism and, and there's been uh, major street protests, do you think there's a possibility or what is the likelihood that uh, as a distraction Hezbollah will indeed begin some sort of skirmish or some sort of attack to distract from all their failings within Lebanon itself? Peter, first of all, on that. So what we know is that Hezbollah and, and Hassan Nasrallah, that the secretary general of Hezbollah, have said that there is an open account with Israel uh, following uh, uh, one of their uh, operatives that was one of their terrorists that was killed uh, in an exchange attributed to, to Israel. And um, I think that the, the Israeli defense forces up north are taking the threat extremely serious. Uh, They've, they've for, for the last three months now, they've been on, on high alert um, and conducting uh, activities and, and trying to maintain. So I think, uh, will he make, do an action or take a step that will jeopardize the internal stability of Lebanon further? I doubt it. But the problem with open uh, accounts, when you have to, when you promise to do something, you have to deliver on that promise in order to save face. Yeah. And the, the the problem of trying to deliver a blow in response to something that is attributed to Israel, um, is you know where you begin, you don't know where it ends. And it could actually spiral out of control and lead to the third Lebanon war, which nobody has any interest in at this time. And, and Benjamin, just one final word on this one. Um, well, I think, again, it's um, Hezbollah's, um, you know, gunning for uh, an attack against Israel because of this uh, alleged uh, um, liquidation of a Hezbollah terrorist in Damascus that was attributed to, to Israel. So I would expect Hezbollah to retaliate. We don't know in, in what form, whether that's going to be within uh, Israel proper or another uh, Hezbollah-sponsored terrorism event abroad, as we saw recently in uh, Burgas, Bulgaria, with the conviction of two Hezbollah terrorists in Burgas, uh, in Sofia, excuse me, for their role in blowing up an Israeli tour bus in 2012 that murdered five Israelis and uh, uh, a Bulgarian Muslim bus driver, as well as injuring over 31. So we'll, we'll just see where Hezbollah plans to respond. but. I think uh, obviously Nasrallah is um, intensely worried about Israel right now because of uh, um, they're they're in a crisis uh, because of financial situation, 
COVID and they're strapped um, due to the war in Syria. Yeah, it's a fascinating subject. It's one that I certainly could sit and chat about for hours, but um, it's great to have had your insight, guys, because uh, you're both uh, so uh, knowledgeable on this particular subject. But while we've got problems with uh, Hamas and tunnels in the south and Hezbollah, where also there's been a tunnel, of course, uh, at least one tunnel discovered uh, uh, in the north in the not too distant past, there are signs of uh, better things in the region uh, that we've pointed to uh, in recent programs. And of course, uh, we have um, the deal with uh, the UAE already pretty much signed and uh, Israeli tourists, once COVID is hopefully behind us, are possibly going to be rushing away to uh, Dubai for their holidays. Peter, I'll ask you as far as it goes with people working in the holiday industry, how's that going to affect somewhere like Elat, first of all, where so many people rely on uh, the uh, tourism there. Uh, but as far as the Bahrain uh, normalization deal goes, an interesting situation here because there's also some internal opposition, we understand, within Bahrain to it. But it is a sign that things are definitely moving in the right direction uh, and that I, I, it seems that people in the region don't see Israel quite as the enemy that they once did uh, in the past. Benjamin, a, a view on this one? Well, yeah, it's it's these agreements between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE um, are are nothing short of a miracle from my perspective. Um, it's um, it's 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 simply a, a game changer in the region and and lays a foundation to. Uh, building for building stronger relations with our uh, Arab neighbors across the entire region, of course, in Bahrain and, and in the UAE. And it'll take time because um, within these countries and also across the Arab world, um, the minds and hearts of um, Arabs, many Arabs across the region have been contaminated with uh, anti-Israel hysteria. And I think it's going to take some time to uh, break down that type of propaganda. And these two agreements um, are, as I've mentioned, will um, breathe new life and fire into uh, the new Middle East. So I'm, I'm actually, um, I would say, excessively optimistic for someone in this region uh, who's been, you know, where there's excessive pessimism about what's happening. And uh, Peter, uh, I don't know if you've been there in the past to that part of the world, but uh, it certainly is a, a remarkable turn of events that we've seen. And there may be more countries that um, normalize their relationships with Israel. Um, how how big a deal do you, do you think it is? And just going back to the point as well about the fact that so many Israelis are planning to go visit Dubai, seeing it as this kind of Las Vegas almost on our doorstep. Is it going to impact a lot on Israeli jobs in places like Ilat, where they rely so heavily on a similar type of a, a holiday? Well, I think, first of all, obviously, the entire tourist industry here in Israel is in a deep crisis uh, because of COVID-19. And if people prefer to go to um, uh, Dubai or Bahrain and uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, rather than going to Eilat or Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Haifa or Caesarea and the places, the wonderful places that we have, then of course there's going to be a problem. But I think also the businesses here have to keep in mind that they need to be able to compete in uh, from from a a business model of how do you make sure that Israelis choose to come to and 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 tourism and tourists as a whole come to um, uh, Israel Israeli hotels uh, and and vacations in, in in Israel. I definitely think though that um, on a whole this is definitely a positive uh, step for the region. Um, I think. Uh, a lot of people were surprised by the the entire scope of it, uh, and yes. definitely look, looking towards the UAE and then talking, uh, moving on to Bahrain. Um, a lot of people didn't really believe that uh, the Trump administration had the ability to get anything to shift, and this is a positive shift. Uh, will this shift change uh, the region as a whole, or will we just have two more tourist destinations to go to? Uh, it remains to remains to stay. I think it's important though to note that in Bahrain, there's been a, a, a reported this week 
that there was there's, there's been an interest a, a diplomatic interest office there for the last 11 years yes, so it's not something new but it's just bringing it out into the sun um, uh, and I think that this is something that that, that can uh, create a positive uh, um, momentum for the region as a whole and I would definitely hope that this can spill over this the, 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 the spill over into our immediate neighbors uh, the Palestinians with you know, we help uh, um, Saeed Barakat in, in the hospital, um, and we can we can we can speak about making peace with the Palestinians as well. I think that's something we also need to keep on the table and talk about how to do it, not necessarily uh, when and 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 who, but definitely we need to get that in emotions. And I think there is hope for that to happen as well. Well, we've got um, UAE already sort of signed up. Um, We've got Bahrain. I'm not so sure if they've finally signed the whole deal, but uh, it's certainly very close to it. And there's talk of other um, places in the region as well. And uh, Benjamin, one place that has been attracting a lot of attention just in the last few days, and very briefly before we finish, uh, Sudan appears to be a possibility. What is your view on Sudan? It's hardly one of the world's greatest uh, democratic democratic examples. Is it? Is it somewhere we should be rushing to sign up uh, a deal with? Yes, um, if uh, Sudan is uh, delisted from the U.S. Uh, State Department list as being a state sponsor of terrorism, then I, I do believe Israel should uh, agree to uh, diplomatic relations with uh, Sudan. And there's been this elaborate tango going on now for months. Um, every other, every, it feels like every few days there's a new news item. A breakthrough, Sudan and, and Israel are going to reach diplomatic relations. It has yet to happen, but uh, there appears to be tremendous momentum right now that the U.S. And, and Trump actually did announce this, that Sudan will be delisted. The question is, is whether it's an ironclad agreement as part of this delisting, as a being delisted as a terrorist uh, state, that a condition of this agreement is that uh, Sudan will recognize Israel and there will be diplomatic relations. But I certainly think another country in uh, Northern Africa, um, a Muslim majority country, is uh, another way to uh, radically change the Middle East into um, a democratic project. And uh, Peter, just for the final word on this about Sudan, and also uh, if you have a view on the fact that uh, Dubai uh, is going to be opening, uh, the UAE opening an embassy in Israel, but it's going to be in Tel Aviv. And any thoughts on that one? I think traditional. I mean, first of all, they have to operate within the realm of the regional politics. I think for them to put a embassy anywhere else would, would cause them internal trouble and strife yes. that they don't need. Um, uh, it's not like you know, uh, we've seen lots of positive images coming out of uh, the United Arab Emirates, but not so positive coming out from Bahrain. So that needs that needs to be managed internally for, based on the internal political needs. With regard to Sudan, Sudan over probably the last five, six years, we, we had seen Sudan as a corridor for transferring of rockets to Gaza. Uh, yes. Um, so I, I think we need to be cautious, uh, but definitely there are bet more interests that, that they're to open that, that, that accord if they are no longer facilitating and helping terrorists. So if they're not, and I have a lot of faith in our intelligence uh, capabilities to know if they are or not. Um, and also the, the idea that um, it, making a peace deal would perhaps prevent that from happening again in the future. So if we don't have a corridor uh, for terrorist activities and terrorism, and if we don't have, uh, and there is a, uh, an optimistic perspective about the ability of uh, making peace, I'm all for it. Well, that's a very optimistic note to finish on. And time has absolutely flown. It's been a really interesting discussion. And Peter, we didn't have a chance to talk so much about the social issues and the workers issues that you're so involved in at the moment. I hope you'll come back another time and uh, we'll look into those uh, issues relating to the news in future. But Peter, thanks very much. And as always, uh, Benjamin Weinthal, thank you for your uh, insight as well. And thanks very much uh, for joining us here at Real Israel on our What the Israeli Paper saying we'll be back uh, same time again next week with another look at what's actually going on here across the political spectrum in Israel. Bye-bye for now.